Good morning, everyone. Good morning. It's just a wonderful pleasure and a joy for me to be here with you today on this, the last Sunday of the Easter season. I was talking with someone after the 8 o'clock service, and I think this might actually be my first regular style visit to a parish in the Diocese of New Jersey. And the reason I say regular style is I've been here, um, I think this might be my fifth week on the ground, but I was at the cathedral, which is a different entity altogether, on my first Sunday. And since then I've been in places responding to situations where, uh, where my presence is needed, but not so much a an organized and scheduled visit on the morning when something is happening to celebrate with the community. And every time I turn this way, the microphone picks me up, doesn't it? Yeah. I'll preach like it. <laughs> but it's great to be here. Uh, and it's especially a joy to be here on this Sunday uh, when we celebrate the ascension of Jesus. It's one of those quirky days in our church calendar, uh, 40 days after Easter, but 10 days before Pentecost. And it is normally, obviously, 40 days after Easter lands immediately on a Thursday. So churches often gather and remember, not just on a Thursday, but on a Sunday as well. And it's wonderful to have this time with you. Uh, 23 years ago, when I was much, much younger and a brand new deacon. I had the tremendous privilege and opportunity of spending a year living and working in the Holy Land. I got to go to work at St. George's College in Jerusalem, which is the Anglican Communion Center for Pilgrimage and Study. And I was there working with students and pilgrims from around the world. I would uh, work with the groups and they would take them out to visit the different sites and places. Uh, and it was wonderful because in addition to all this travel with, with pilgrim groups, because I was living there, I would get to go and hang out in the holy places. So on my days off, I would go to the the Church of the Resurrection, the Holy Sepulchre, the place where uh, we're pretty certain, actually, the archaeological record is, is strong, and um, it's likely that that is actually the place of the resurrection. And I would go to other sites that might have had different, you know, the authenticity of the site varied somewhat, depending on the tradition. Um, the saying there is, holy places move. Uh, but one of the things that I didn't get to very often was the place of the ascension. And as I reflected on it after my experience there, I was surprised I only went twice in the year that I was there, both times with groups. I didn't ever take myself back to the place of the ascension to sit and reflect and pray and wander around. And that surprised me. It was a little inconvenient to get to, but so were lots of places. It's uh, about a mile or so from the old city wall, perhaps a little less. But if you've ever been to the Holy Land, how many here have? Okay, great. So some of you can picture this landscape well. There is the valley just outside the city wall, and then the Mount of Olives that goes uh, pretty straight up on the other side. So it wasn't an easy walk, but it was certainly a manageable one. Um, the scriptures tell us that the place of the ascension is at the very top of the Mount of Olives, at the highest point on that hill. Not that far from the old city, but far enough. And it happens that there are ruins there of a chapel that dates from as early as 329. So some of the oldest Christian ruins in the Holy Land. You think that's an astonishing number. It goes back further than many of us can imagine. And it was built at the place where the local Christian tradition remembered the last glimpse that they had of Jesus Christ as he was lifted away from them, ascending into heaven only 40 days after that first Easter Sunday. It's the last thing that we read about in the Gospel of Luke, and the first thing we read about in the Acts of the Apostles, as our first lesson this morning was from the Acts of the Apostles. And it's that moment when the disciples are left behind to carry out the mission and ministry of Jesus Christ in the world. It's that last moment when the earthly body of Jesus, the body that had walked in the Galilee, born in Bethlehem, taught and prayed and healed and strengthened and blessed his community, the body that had been crucified and died and then rose again. It's the last moment when they saw that embodied presence of Jesus. 
and the disciples were left instead with a new future, one in which they themselves were to become the body of Christ in the world. Now I gather that I am preaching right next to the Ascension window here, and I love that. I didn't know that. Sorry, I didn't know that earlier when I preached at eight o'clock. But if you look here, you can see this incredible depiction of Jesus ascending into heaven, and the last thing you're left with in the image is his toes kind of dangling down from the cloud. Um, I love that. By ascending into heaven, Jesus returns to his rightful place with the Creator and the Spirit, and just a few days later, he sends that Holy Spirit to renew the community, and the church is born. And that's what we'll celebrate next week at Pentecost. But those in-between days must have felt empty indeed. The memory of the ascension of Jesus, together with the spot on the Mount of Olives where it all happened, was such a powerful one for the Christians in Jerusalem that that chapel was built sometime around 329, 330, the place where the community remembered the ascension. Now that chapel that was built was a relatively simple structure. It was eight-sided, which was common in the Roman world, and it had a, an arcade around the holy place. What was really unusual about it, though, was that they never built a roof. It was deliberately left wide open to the elements, open and uncovered in anticipation of Christ's return. Can you imagine? And it does rain in Jerusalem. Can you imagine sitting in there year after year, Sunday after Sunday, especially the Sunday of the Ascension or the Sunday after the Thursday of the Ascension, and, you know, being rained on or snowed on, or just seeing the sky above the blazing heat, knowing that it was open for a reason to wait for the, the return of Jesus who had left from that place in that way. If you visit today, there's a, a marking on the rock, and one of the rocks that's carefully framed off on the floor, and it's associated, it's supposed to be the footprint of Jesus. Now you have to squint and hold your head sideways to see the actual <laughs> foot shape in there. But it's this idea of the place from which he left, the last point at which his foot was on the ground. It's imagine him just ascending above the gathered crowd in that way. I think human beings are often quite neutral. So the community would gather and they would wait for Jesus to come back in exactly the same way that he had been taken up from them, making sure that they never closed off that roof to obstruct the return. They were looking and hoping for God to come again. It's very interesting to me, though, that the last thing that the disciples saw of Jesus, the, last, the lowest part in this image right here, and in many Christian images of the Ascension, is what? It's his feet, right? The last thing that you see of Jesus is his feet. And yet, in the Middle Eastern culture, then and now, feet are considered somewhat impolite. It's rude to show someone the soles of your feet. So if you go into an Orthodox church anywhere in the world, and you cross your legs enough that the bottom of your shoe is visible, someone will come over and ask you to put your foot on the floor so that they don't see the soles of your feet. Um, feet are messy, right? They walk through all kinds of things. Uh, they, they're often rough and dusty. They're perhaps a little too exposed to the most basic aspects of human existence. And yet they feature, sorry, um, they feature in many stories in our scriptures, you know, the story of the, the washing of the feet, but there's stories in the Old Testament about feet as well. Perhaps that's the whole point. This Jesus who has been taken from us into heaven will indeed come again. He comes to us in the most basic aspects of our humanity in the rough and dusty places where we need him most. He comes to us in compassion for our human weakness, and he is with us as we walk through the challenges of our lives. Jesus doesn't avoid those things that we consider ugly or impolite or unclean. Jesus doesn't avoid those places of pain and weakness. Perhaps that's what those two men in white robes are trying to tell us from the first lesson today that the ascension of Jesus and the promise of his return is not about a precise spot in the skies over Jerusalem. It's about human need and brokenness, and about a God who cannot, does not, 
and it will not leave us to suffer alone. The ascension of Jesus and the promise of his return is all about those places where we struggle, those aspects of human existence that we deem unworthy or improper or in need of redemption. It's even about those places that we consider too ordinary and unimportant to be worthy of God. But then that's the Christian story from the very beginning, isn't it? The God who comes to us in a manger, in the water of baptism, in bread and wine, in human suffering, in grief, in love, in the tomb, and in hope. To put it another way, if we want to see Christ, we should look around instead of up. At the people who share our lives, at the opportunities and callings that we experience, those places where we are all too aware of our fragile humanity. The easiest place to see Christ today is not in the skies over Jerusalem. It's not in Canterbury Cathedral or St. Peter's in Rome, or even here at Trinity Asbury Park, because it's not limited to buildings or institutions. Instead, the easiest place to see Christ today is in the people of God, in the work of the body of Christ in the world, in moments of generosity and compassion and forgiveness, and healing, and love. And my friends, that is work that you do so very well. Your ministries have touched this community in profound ways. You are out there feeding people and walking with people, quite literally. You are out there showing God's love and compassion in ways that many people in our wider community have never experienced before and don't imagine they could receive from a Christian church. You are doing the work of the risen, ascended Jesus Christ in your encounters with one another and with the world around. And that's amazing. So once upon a time, when I was thinking many years ago, I came back from Jerusalem and I had a wonderful experience and I figured I had to go and do a doctoral program or something somewhere. Turned out that that wasn't quite what I was called to. Um, but I spent a lot of time reading books on the places I'd been and the things I'd seen. And one of those books that I really enjoyed was a book by a Spanish nun who wrote around the year 385. You might have heard of her. Her name is Egeria or Etheria. They think she was a Spanish nun. No one's entirely sure. But she made a pilgrimage to the Holy Land from Spain at the very end of the fourth century. And she describes the worship of the Christian community in Jerusalem. Uh, through the Easter season in great detail. And one of my favorite parts about the, the descriptions, one of the, the most interesting things that she described was the way that they celebrated the Feast of the Ascension in the fourth century. You know what they did? They would gather the community at the Church of the Resurrection, the Holy Sepulchre, the place where we remember the resurrection of Jesus. It's right that the same building contains the place of the crucifixion as well. They would gather the entire Christian community from Jerusalem, and they would walk the entire community out of the city, down through the Kidron Valley, and up the Mount of Olives to the Chapel of the Ascension that I talked about earlier. And when I say the entire community, they took the frail, the sick, the injured, the disabled, everyone. You know how long that walk took? It took 18 hours. It was done over two days. They would walk people from the age, the heart of the city, all the way up to the place of the ascension in order to celebrate, and no one was left behind. I love that image, that no one is left behind. So I said earlier that after my year in Jerusalem, I realized in hindsight that I had only visited the chapel of the ascension twice. And as I reflect on this, I suspect it's because that reminder of how the risen Jesus left is an invitation to look deeper and harder at the ways that our risen Lord is with us, right beside us, in the community that walks with us, in moving as slowly as we need in order to go together, in the community that walks that walk that could take an hour, in 18 hours, in order to make sure that we are in it together. We serve one another in love. 
I suspect that that reminder of how the risen Jesus left us is an invitation to find him not in the skies above Jerusalem, but in deep and loving connection with the community, to find him at Christ's altar in bread and wine that is shared with all. May we find him present in our community as we gather today. May we look for him in the world around. And may we know the presence of the risen, ascended Christ through our love for one another and for his world. Amen. Amen.